Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you to welcome you to this assembly. We give you respect and acknowledge you as our creator and provider. You are everywhere, Lord. You have all of the power and you know everything. God, as we begin this worship assembly, we ask that you would guide our thoughts and our actions so that we may glorify you in all that we do and say. Help us in all we do and say to bear witness to your character. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. Lord, the people praise you. Lord, the people praise you. We lift you up and raise you. Lift you up and Nobody above you. Place nobody oh, above you. Because you are the Holy One. You are the Holy My One. My God, you're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only and one. And we're singing Alle, Alle, Hallelujah. Alle, Alle, All the glory is to you. All the glory oh, is to you. Father, you are the Holy One. You are the Holy One. In my heart, in my heart. 
Jesus, we love you. Yes, we do. Dear Father, thank you for the plans you have for each believer, their families, and for our church. You have plans for our good and for your glory. We embrace the teachings of your word that helps us to understand that the church is your house and a temple built for you to abide in as your presence among your people. You dwell in our midst as your people. Help us become established on the firm foundation of your son, Jesus Christ. May your spirit build this fellowship together in the way that honors you. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith so that we being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, amen. We now prepare our hearts to commemorate the work of our Savior at Calvary. We ask that you give your attention to the unleavened bread. With this bread, we are reminded of the sinless sacrifice of our Savior. His sacrifice established the fellowship of believers. And by partaking in this unleavened bread, we are reminded to keep our relationships with each other pure. The Apostle Paul says, let us keep the feast not with the leaven of wickedness and malice, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let us give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you for this reminder that our relationships with each other is to be without wickedness and malice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may eat the bread. We now ask you to prepare to partake of the cup. 
With this cup, we focus on the blood sacrifice that enables us to have fellowship with Christ. When we partake, we declare that we have been forgiven of our sins and have been brought into union with him and his purpose for our lives. Let us give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you for this reminder of blood sacrifice that brings us into fellowship with your son. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Amen. You may now partake of the cup. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to give my life to Jesus. My soul, oh, my soul, oh, yeah, give me my own. Just as in communion, our giving involves two kinds of responses. Our first response is an acknowledgement of the income that God has provided us to meet our daily needs. By faith, we return to him a just representation of the regular income, which is called the tithe. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in meeting our daily needs. 
and for giving us the power to gain wealth. We acknowledge your faithfulness to us by our giving of the tithe and for the support of this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to this another presentation of Light of Life Communication, the pulpit ministry of the Reseda Church. And uh, we have been doing, we have been preparing lessons uh, that are motivational and inspirational in nature to galvanize believers uh, toward this post-demic era, a new era in which we are entering into, uh, which God expects you to have a new beginning. We call it crossing over from the wilderness experiences of the past, where we 
have been constantly and continuously, you may have been constantly and continuously learning uh, the meaning of trusting God, the meaning of depending upon God in terms of faith. And now God wants you to possess your possessions. He wants you to experience the blessings that are promised uh, uh, in association with your relationship with God. All the promises of God, the Bible says, are yes. And when Israel went into the promised land, uh, they had to face their enemies and they had to rely upon what they have learned, what they had learned about God in a covenant relationship, being in a covenant relationship with God. And uh, they allowed that experience to drive them in terms of, of possessing the land that God had already given to them uh, as a gift of faith, but they had to possess it by faith. And so life, we understand, is not a 50-yard dash. It is a marathon that requires endurance. It requires resilience. It, resilience. it, re it requires you, that you uh, learn how to overcome many discouragements. And uh, you're often going to have feelings that you should quit uh, and give up. But you need to understand that the Christian faith equips you with the kind of faith that is needed. And this is why we read over and over again, there's an emphasis uh, in the Bible that stress over and over again about the kind of faith that endures. All faith is not the kind of faith uh, that God is uh, challenging the believer with. Spiritual faith is faith that is responsive to God's will, uh, faith that recognizes who Christ is as God and responds to him in that in that way. Now, there are foundational commitments. Now, keep in mind, Christian faith equips you with a kind of, that the kind of faith you need, but that faith also uh, has routine practices that sustains its enduring character. So there are foundational commitments, what we call routine practices that sustains the uh, perseverance of faith, the enduring power of faith. And these practices can be called the security practices of Christian faith, the security practices. And without these practices, you'll find yourself giving up, you'll find yourself weak, you'll find yourself uh, not experiencing divine accomplishments, but only human achievements. And we want you to go beyond human achievements to experience and live in the arena uh, of divine power, the power of God's presence, the power of God's providence, the power of, what, of all that God provides for you and promises you in Christ Jesus. Today's focus then is gonna be on uh, the routine practices that ensures that you will have a better, a brighter, and a better future. Uh, the theme that we are, have been developing is preparing your life for a brighter future. The, the last two messages had to do with that. We talked about living by faith goals, and uh, we talked about experiencing the power that's associated with praising God, uh, how to praise God even if you're not musical, even if, you're, uh, even if you don't feel uh, that you're capable of, say, singing, you can say the praise uh, because God expects you to use your mouth and your voice uh, to praise him. And so there are routine practices that sustains the enduring power of faith. And you can refer to this as the security practices. Now, I want you to note the emphasis that the Bible uh, gives to the believer in terms of just keep on keeping on. Uh, and, and of course, the Bible teaches that the kind of faith that will endure uh, is uh, the kind of faith that is saving in character. What makes eternal life eternal is the fact of that God gives you a faith that can be sustained uh, not only now, but throughout eternity. Now notice in Colossians, the second chapter and verse number six, uh, the writer says this, you have accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord. Now keep on following him. Under, underline that, that, that phrase, keep on. Keep on following him. The most repeated descriptions of real faith is perseverance, the ability to endure, the ability to be persistent, to be resilient. Your faith is nurtured by practices that enable your faith to be enduring, persistent, and resilient. And so faith is, is nurtured by consistent routines of faith that ensures your future. And that's what we're going to expose you to. And I want to give you this, you know, little at a time because I need you to appropriate this. We want you to experience this. We want you to know the practical uh, aspects of this. And, and so we're just going to give you three of these and we'll come back in, in a, another lesson, in the second lesson, part two of this, and give you uh, the other three. But you need to understand that there are routine faith practices that ensures your future, that makes your future 
with the Lord secure. Here is the first principle, and that is I must routinely, I must routinely clean my conscience. I must routinely purify my heart. That's the principle uh, that has to do with having a clear conscience. And it has often been said that a clean engine is more powerful, is a, most, a more powerful engine. And that's the idea uh, of this particular routine practice of purification. It is essential in your life for more spiritual power. Do you not know that you cannot have the type of power uh, that's enduring, the type of power that's resilient, if you are constantly carrying around a load of guilt, a shame, regret, all of these things emotionally drains you of spiritual energy. And therefore, the first step uh, in a divine assignment, understand this, is personal cleansing. The first step in terms of stepping into the future of a brighter, uh, stepping into a brighter future is personal cleansing. You know, the history of all the greats of the Bible reveals this pattern, that a new assignment uh, of greater use is always followed by purification. Uh, individuals who learn how to deal and be responsible for their sin. God uses holy and clean people, not perfect people, because if we had to be perfect to be used by God, there would be nobody to be used because we're in a broken world and everybody has brokenness in their life. But you need to understand that the starting point of a divinely blessed ministry uh, is Purifying your heart is purification. Second Timothy 2 and verse 21, uh, the Bible says this, if you keep yourself, underline that, keep yourself pure, you will be a utensil God used for his purpose. Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the, for the use, you'll be ready to use for every good work. The master will use you for every good work. You know, uh, the great, uh, early century saint called Augustine said that the, that the confession of bad works is the beginning of good works. That is, you have to clean the dish uh, before putting new food on it. Uh, you have to have, you have, it always start with a cleansing. Personal cleansing is the act literally of putting on the protective armor of God. Do you not know uh, when Paul lists the armor that a believer uh, must have in order to withstand the wiles of the devil. Uh, one, the first thing after you uh, put your 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 uh, put your trousers on, as he may describe it, he said you you put a belt of integrity around it, and then he says comes the breastplate of righteousness. Notice in First Peter three. In other words, what, what, what we're saying here, and, and that righteousness that is described in Ephesians 6 is not talking about positional righteousness. That is what God has imputed to you by virtue of the fact that you're in Christ and Christ has paid, you know, the price for all of your sins. Uh, that's not the kind of righteousness. He's talking about the practical side of that. That is the process of becoming pure. God has purified you through obedience to the gospel, and now you are in the body of Christ for the purpose of becoming what God has already declared concerning you. God has made you holy, now you become holy. So personal cleansing is the act of putting on the protective armor of, of spiritual integrity, and it's protective. Notice in 1 Peter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, keep a clear conscience before God. Now, why is that? He said, so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. I like the message translation, you know, of that verse. That is, you're going to be removing, when you go through the personal cleansing process, you are literally removing unnecessary weights in your life. You cannot have spiritual strength and you cannot have, you cannot exercise, you know, what you need to be exercising as a believer in facing uh, a future with all of the various challenges that you're going to face if you are not uh, prepared and fully ready to exercise or to manifest spiritual strength. You can't be depleted by carrying a load of weight, load of stress, load of guilt, load of, of worry. You're going to have to remove unnecessary weights. Notice in Romans 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, hate what's evil and do what? Hold on to what is good. 
So carrying the burdens of the past, such as the garbage, sometimes people go into new relationships carrying the garbage of a previous relationship, enter into a new marriage carrying the garbage of a previous marriage. And, and what that does is simply damages the prospects you know, of a brighter future. It damages that because you, can't, you have to first deal with and discard all of the hurts and damages of the past in order that you can have a fresh new start. The way you unload, understand this, the way you unload these weights is through a simple practice called confession. That is through confession. And you know where the word confession means that is confession of sin. And confession simply uh, comes from two, a compound Greek word, and it's called homo legeo. Homo legeo. Homo means same. Legeo is the word I speak. And it simply means to speak the same. That is, when you confess, you are literally speaking the same as God about a particular problem or about a particular sin. You're just simply saying, God, I agree with you that that was wrong. So person, and understand this, that personal, in, personal cleansing includes addressing unconscious, unremembered guilt and shame. Many times things are plaguing your life and you may not even realize or even remember what it's all about. And do you not know that God has given you the resource, you know, for addressing unconscious guilt and shame? In the Old Testament, that was a practice that was annual uh, called uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, that is the Day of Atonement when that was a ritual uh, that was uh, performed on that day that literally covered all the sin, sins of the people that they were not conscious of. All sins were covered by that scapegoat uh, ritual that was performed on the Day of Atonement. So the point is, personal cleansing includes, understand, addressing unconscious uh, guilt and shame that's holding you down. Sins that have been forgotten. And let me tell you how you do that. The practice of getting along with God is literally designed for this purpose. You can't deal with unconscious and unremembered sin if you don't practice the quietness when God says, uh, be still and know that I'm God. So you are uh, given a routine practice of spending time with God where you simply get quiet and you pray Psalms 139 and verse 23. And this is how you, how you deal with unconscious uh, and unremembered shame and sin. And that is, uh, the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And that's what you're saying to God when you get quiet and you're, you're going through this, this uh, exercise of purification, of cleansing, cleansing and clearing your conscience. You're saying, God, search me and know my heart and test me and know my thoughts and point out to me anything that offends you. God wants you, understand this, that God wants you as a vessel of life. God wants to bless your life. And he uses many, understand this, God uses many kinds of vessels. He uses small vessels, large vessels. He uses cracked vessels. He, he, he even uses broken vessels. But guess what he does not use? And that is he will not use a dirty vessel. One thing that's, that can be holding you back and that is, that is holding you back in terms of God really fully utilizing and blessing your life is unconfessed sin. And I want to encourage you uh, as it relates to that issue, don't ignore it, don't repress it, don't suppress it, but you have to confess it. And you may say, well, how do I do this? You know, what is the actual practice of, of going through a personal cleansing? What you need to do, and I've done this many times, I want you, you need to get along with God and just uh, get along with God with a sheet of paper. And then you pray Psalms 139, search me, O God, and know my heart, test me and know my thoughts and point out anything in me that offends you. You know, you pray that prayer and then uh, you simply quiet yourself and whatever comes to mind, write it down. Just write it down. Whatever uh, you begin to recall in terms of things that you have done wrong, sins that you've committed, you know, against others, against God, uh, that you need to confess to God, you just write it down. And when those things that when those things come up and you write it down, you you agree with God. That is, you confess, you agree with God on what He has revealed, and then continue waiting. Don't say, "Okay, God, you've had five minutes and and you you've revealed this." Friends, these things you know take time. These these exercises take time, and so you have to just wait and see if God, Lord, is there anything else you know that I need to write on this list that I need to put on this list? And once you have prepared that list, uh, you take that list. 
And uh, I got this idea from another uh, person who was going through this particular exercise. Say, you're right on it, First John 1, 9. And that is that statement where John says, if we confess our sins, uh, that's the condition. And where is the promise? He said, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You just write that across that list and you just simply ball it up and throw it away. Uh, you are engaged in that exercise of purification. Now, the question is, what is the primary importance of this faith routine? Let me tell you, let me give you about three reasons why this is so important. Number one, uh, for relief, for relief. Oh, what a relief. Uh, you're going to experience. And you probably share, you probably be able then to identify with the feeling that David expressed in Psalms 5 and verses 5, 7, and 10. David says this, David said, Lord, I have been out of step with you for a long time. What, are you, what you're after is truth from the inside out. He says, scrub me and, I have, and, I, and I'll have a snow white life. Clean me out. God, make me a... Make me a fresh start in me. Make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. You know, can you imagine that? And there are many of you who could say, you know, I've really been out of, out of step with God for a long time. And I need God to scrub my life. You know, so the first thing is you're going to experience freedom, the freedom from the anxiety and the stress of carrying a load of unconfessed sin. And then the second thing is it is the key to greater power. You want greater power in your life? Just imagine how you're going to be refreshed and re-energized as a result of claiming that promise, you know, going through that exercise and claiming the promise associated with it that he will forgive you of all your past sins. Job, Job the 17th chapter in verse 9, the Bible says, though, Job said, those with clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. Friends, if you want to grow strong, uh, then you're going to have to purify your heart. Uh, and then here's the prerequisite. Uh, here's, here's why this is so important, because it's a prerequisite for entering the true sanctuary of God's presence. Notice uh, in the psalmist, the psalmist says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul uh, on the vanity not sworn deceitfully, uh, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord. Friends, God wants to bless your life, uh, and you want to be able to always to enter into communion with God, into the very presence of God, and abide in his presence. Uh, and the way you abide continuously in the presence of God is being accountable for sin in your life and confessing that sin to God, because God is a gracious God. He's forgiven you, but he wants you to be accountable for wrong uh, that you commit against him and others. And then here's the second principle, because this leads, uh, uh, this, this leads to a great benefit. I want you to understand this. When you talk about purification, that here is the greatest benefit associated with purification, and that benefit is called spiritual vision. Do you not know in Matthew 5 and verse 8, the Bible said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you not know you are opening the eyes of your heart uh, when you engage in purifying your heart? Then you open the eyes of your heart and you experience what is called spiritual vision. Now, there are many misguided views of vision. When the Bible talks about uh, Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, they should see God. You know, he's not talking about uh, seeing, planning, and predicting your future. That's not, that's not what vision is about. You know, the, the vision that is spoken of here that results from the process of purification uh, is different. It is simply the capacity uh, to see. In other words, it is the capacity to see what God is doing. Uh, that's what this vision is. It is the capacity to see God, quote unquote, see God. Now, let's uh, that leads us into the second routine that I want to share with you in terms of uh, what ensures your future, and that is I must keep my faith focused. When God gives you spiritual vision, then you have to engage in the practice of keeping that vision focused. It's one thing to have vision, uh, that is the ability to see, see God. It's another thing for your vision to be focused. Keeping faith focused involves two things. 
The first thing that it involves is seeing God at work in your present situation. That's what he's talking about. You know, when a person uh, becomes a child of God, the Bible said God gives them a spirit of, of wisdom and revelation. In the, they have an attitude of revelation, and that is a desire to see God at work, looking for God's actions in your life and in the lives of others. The ability to see that is what the process of purification does. And so it's number one, seeing God at work in your present situation, especially you need to have uh, this capacity in the challenging times of your life. Notice in Psalms 105 verse four, in the message translation, it says, keep your eyes open for God, watch for his works, be alert for signs of his presence. And that's the attitude of revelation when you are keeping your eyes, you're keeping your faith focused. And so you're watching for the works of God. You are watching for the signs of his presence. And God wants you to do that because he's given you the ability to see it. You know, focusing your faith uh, is able to, you're able to set your sails uh, on what God is doing right now, not looking for a wave to come in in the future, but you're able, to, you're able to see the present wave that's already coming in and you can set your sails to ride on that wave uh, because God has given you the spiritual insight, the spiritual capacity to see uh, the activity of God. It means aligning your commitments to what God is presently blessing. You need to stop asking God, God, I want you to bless what I'm doing. You need to, you need to abandon that type of praying and you need to begin praying, Lord, just privilege me, allow me to be included in what you are presently blessing. And you need to be seeing what God is doing, what he is making available for his people. Even during this pandemic, God is doing some awesome things uh, that you can, you can uh, tap into and he wants you to tap into it because it's all about what he plans for your life and what he wants for you. Uh, but you got to be able to have that capacity to see what God is doing. Now, focusing your faith enables you uh, to see not only what God is presently doing, but it also enables you to see good ideas that may come from others. Uh, how you can use good ideas from others in your own situation. Do you not know? Notice Proverbs 18 and verse 15. The Bible says this. It says, wise men and women are always learning and always listening for fresh insights. Do you not know that if you are a spiritual leader, leaders never stop learning? All leaders are learners. Leaders who stop learning, they actually stop leading because that's what leading is all about. You know, it's all about leading people uh, into uh, their future. Now, the point is, uh, so if you're a leader, then you are always learning. And the mark of wisdom is the ability to learn from other people. Do you not know a spiritually wise person is able to learn from anyone? It doesn't matter how educated or uneducated that, be, that person might be. God gives you the ability. You have the ability to learn from anyone. All you need to do is know how to ask the right question. Your faith as a believer enables you to learn from every situation, every circumstance, every person that you encounter. It doesn't matter how spiritual or unspiritual, good or bad, your faith provides you with the necessary filters to be able to see wisdom uh, in, those in those people, see knowledge in those circumstances, and abstract that, you know, with discernment and be able to use it for your good. And that's what God uh, gives you when you focus your faith. That is, you, once you get vision, you get the capacity to see, then he wants you to focus your faith so you can see what he wants you to see. And that is how even the good ideas of others can be used in your particular situations. You know, all of us are ignorant in different subjects. You learn from anyone by asking the right questions. And, uh, uh, simply because uh, that's what the way God did. God expects his people to learn from every person, an institution he places in this world serving purposes both of good and evil. That's why uh, we go to universities and learn under unbelievers wisdom that helps us to even govern the church, you know, help us organize, help us do things that God wants us to do in his kingdom. Because God is the cosmic ruler of the universe. Colossians 1, uh, the Bible teaches us, verses 15 to 20, that everything that God puts here, even satellites that's put in, put in orbit, they are for him. And we have to be, have the ability to see that God many times speaks to the church and reveals to the church and teaches the church from speaking 
from the culture. And not only does he speak from the church to the culture, but he speaks from the culture to the church. And we got to learn that because Christ is over it all. That's why the Bible says from the rising of the sun, you know, to the setting of the sun, that you might know that I am the Lord. I, I create the darkness. I make peace. He said, I, the Lord, I create evil. He said, I, the Lord, do all these things. God accepts responsibility for everything that is transpiring in this universe. Even though he is not the author of it, he accepts responsibility for it because it happens it, it transpires within his divine scheme of things, his divine purposes. So God expects you to learn from every person, every institution that he places in the world. Now, understand this. Now, you know, and the, the importance of that is you can learn. I learn, for example, I learn from churches that are smaller than our church. I learn from churches that are larger than our church. I learn from ministers that may not, that may be prosperity preachers. I learn from ministers who are educated but may not necessarily understand the truth of the gospel as it is presented in the word of God. God gives, gives us all of that. He gives us these institutions for us to learn from. You know, and so we need to understand uh, that God gives us others for the purpose of learning and and abstracting His wisdom. He gives us filters that we can abstract His wisdom and progress as a result. And so we need to first understand the importance of what is called imitation. Do you not know in Philippians three and verse seventeen, Paul says, "Brethren, be united in imitating me. Keep your eyes fixed on those who act according to the example you have from me." You know, now Paul encouraged imitation four times in scripture. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, that seems kind of arrogant, you know, for, to find myself trying to say something like that. But I realized that most of what everybody learned, they learn by imitation. It's not by innovation, it's by imitation. That was a study that came out of Harvard that says that imitation is more important than innovation. You know, we learn most of what we know by imitation. We learn how to walk by imitating others, talk uh, by imitating others, eat by imitating others. Many of the skills that we have acquired, we acquire those skills through imitation. And so a focused faith enables you to see the good that God is doing in the lives and works of all mankind. And you don't have to be an originator of an idea for something literally to work. Imitation often trumps innovation. And my prayer for you, according to God's will, uh, in Ephesians 1 and verse 18, he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with light so that you can understand the wonderful future he has promised to those he called. Now, let me give you a third principle, and we'll stop uh, with this one because I want you to really appropriate these in a very practical way. Uh, and, that, and this principle, this routine practice of faith is uh, it really results out of this second practice because notice when God opens your eyes and God gives you spiritual vision and you're able to focus your faith and see what God is doing in the lives of others and what God is providing for you uh, in terms of being able to grow from, uh, you know what it's going to give you? It's going to give you a disposition of gratitude. That is, you're going to be able to do what Paul says, give thanks for everything to God, uh, our Father in he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5 and verse 20. He said, always give thanks for everything to God, our Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be able to give thanks. Uh, and so the practice of faith that is essential in terms of ensuring your future is maintaining an attitude of gratitude. You've got to maintain that attitude. He gives it to you by your ability to see and your ability to focus your faith, and now you have to maintain it. Thanksgiving and praise, let me tell you something. They are antidotes to stress and discouragement. You cannot be depressed and, 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 and be thankful at the same time. Notice in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, the Bible said, through thick and thin, Keep your hearts and at attention in adoration before Christ. You know, say, well, what is adoration? Adoration is praising God for who he is and thanking God for what he has done. And so the Bible says, through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ. Do you not know uh, health professionals and scholars, they all agree that gratitude is the most healthiest emotion uh, that one can express. It is more the more grateful you are, the more healthier you're going to be. So if you stay grateful, you, if you, if you're not, let me tell you something. Uh, if you don't stay grateful, you're going to become cynical. 
uh, because people and problems are going to hurt you. They're going to bring hurt in your life. And if you don't understand, you know, how and you don't have the capacity to express gratitude as a result of those other faith routines, uh, then you're going to end up becoming a cynical person. You know, petition and gratitude. Understand this. Prayer and gratitude goes together. Whenever you ask God for a need in your life, you always ask God while expressing gratitude for what he has done, for what he is doing, and what he uh, plans to do. Remember, we talked about the power of praise, and one of, one of uh, the resources of that is being able to praise God in advance, praising God in advance. Notice Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse six. The Bible says, in all of your prayers, ask God for what you need, always asking him how with a thankful heart. And so petition and gratitude goes together. And so you need to understand that gratitude is a faith routine. That is, it's a, it's a habit to develop uh, and to be maintained. You ought to be grateful even in hard times, Colossians, the fourth chapter, verse two, the Bible said, keep on praying, keep on being alert, keep on being grateful. And so the maturity of the believer is simply cultivating the attitude of gratitude, even in challenging and difficult situations. Then there are many reasons. I'm just going to give you three reasons. We'll close with this. There are three reasons why you need to cultivate the attitude of gratitude, even in tough situations. Why? Because God, number one, God will give you the strength. God will give me the strength. Notice in Colossians 1 and verse 11, 12, the Bible said, God will strengthen you with his own great power and you will not give up when trouble comes and you will be patient. Then you will joyfully give thanks to the Father. And so God is going to give you the strength uh, to be gracious in all circumstances. Isn't that wonderful? And then the second thing is because bad times can't change God's plan. Uh, bad times, whenever you experience it, why you can be grateful? Because you know that whatever God's plans are, bad times cannot change it. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 28, very powerful passage says, do you see what we've got? He says, an unshakable kingdom. And, and do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, he said, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. I want you to circle that, that, that phrase, unshakable kingdom, you know, of God's plan and purposes. And that's what that's all about. God's plan for your life, his purposes for your life, they are unshakable. And therefore, you can be grateful because you know no negative circumstances is going to change God's plan, you know, for you. And then the third principle is because our lives are are being changed. You know, in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 18, the Bible says, all of us can reflect the glory of the Lord. As the spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like him, and we reflect his glory even more. I like the idea. He said, we can all reflect the glory of God. You know, we all can reflect. Why? Because the spirit of God is working in, in you. And when the spirit of God is working with you, we become more and more like him and we reflect his glory even more. You can be grateful that you are not what you used to be. You know, you may not be all that God wants you to be, but you can say, I thank God. You know, I can remember what I used to be and I know I'm not like what I used to be. Friends, if you haven't taken this step, uh, you know, there are three steps here that we have shared with you. Uh, just in terms of routines of faith that ensures for you a brighter future. And that is you have to purify your heart. Uh, and what that does is going to end up giving you vision. And then as you, as God gives you vision, you have to keep that vision focused. That's called focusing your faith. You have to focus your faith. And then uh, as you are focusing upon what God and seeing what God is doing in the lives of others and in your life, you see all of God's activity in the present circumstances, even as what's going on with this pandemic, what it's going to give you is going to give you a heart full of gratitude. And so the third routine of faith is simply maintaining an attitude of gratitude. Friends, you can begin uh, with being, with surrendering your life to the Lord. And that is simply coming to the realization that you need the Lord in your life and that, that he saved you. He's died for your sins. He's paid, he's made it possible, first of all, for you to stand in a forgiven state. Uh, now, God simply wants you to work on becoming what he has already declared you to be. And that's that idea of purification. You know, so you, but you have to first begin with forgiveness, uh, accepting the forgiveness of God in your life. You can't rely upon forgiveness that you have not first embraced. And so you embrace that. And then you acknowledge Jesus 
uh, that Savior to be your God, to be your Lord, because you're going to follow him and he's going to give you guidance uh, such as you are receiving even in this in this lesson, instructions on how to secure the gifts that he gives you. How do you how do you secure the gift of eternal life? You know, and this is what you're being instructed to do in this lesson. These are called routines of faith. That is practices of security. Uh, and as you do that, you act upon his will. Uh, you acknowledge him to be savior. You acknowledge him to be God. And then you act upon his will for you to belong to his family and therefore receive his spirit into your life uh, and receive his forgiveness as a result of his death. Uh, will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Father, we're so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful for uh, what you have provided for us. Lord, we are grateful for your son and the sacrifice that he made. And we're grateful for the principles of wisdom that you give us that comes out of your word. And for those who even share these principles with us. And Father, for those who uh, are seeking to unload and unburden themselves, Lord, I trust that they will take at heart uh, the importance of what it means to engage in this in this act of purification and then engage and allow themselves to experience spiritual vision as a result and fill their heart with gratitude as a result of that. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.